Well, a very good Sunday morning to you. I'm thrilled you're able to join us for uh, service online. Thrilled that you're a part of our time together today and looking forward to what we're sharing. Uh, just before I get into the message, I do want to just remind you that uh, we are meeting on campus, a uh, live in-person gathering. If you haven't had a chance to do that yet, you're more than welcome to join us. If you go to our website, R for the letter, uh, letter R for Rochester, calvary.org, There'll be a button right at the top of the page that will walk you through a registration process so you can join us for one of our services on Sunday. We're in a series called Being the Church. Truth is, is that you could get bored going to church, but you'll never get bored being the church. So we're unpacking from the book of Acts what that looks like. We're in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said that they had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The church was not conceived in Pentecost, but it was birthed on that day. And people who had been previously timid and intimidated found themselves demonstrating some remarkable courage. They weren't just informed about something, they were transformed by someone. It was quite a remarkable experience. I think most of us desire that. I think lots of us see ourselves as not being very bold or courageous people. There's a part of us that would like to be. And I think that this passage speaks very powerfully to how God can release this capacity in our lives. What we learn is that without the Holy Spirit, we cannot be the church. We can do a service, but we cannot be the church. There really is no understanding without the spirit of truth. There can be no fellowship without a spirit of unity. There can be no Christ-like character without the fruit of the Spirit. There can be no effective witness without the power of the Spirit. 
See, we need the Holy Spirit to be the church. And Pentecost actually dismantles the, the illusion that we are self-sufficient. I think there are lots of voices in our culture today that just basically tell you that if you look inside deep enough and long enough, that you will find whatever you need to become whatever you want. That everything you need is already inside of you. But Pentecost kind of dismantles that concept. And what we realize is that while there's a lot more inside of us than we may have realized, and while we are capable of more than what we have accomplished so far, that we are limited. It's God who is not limited, and he chooses to invest his Holy Spirit into us so that we, can, who, we who are ordinary can do something that's extraordinary. We who are timid can do something that is courageous. The Holy Spirit empowers us to be able to do that. Another good question might be, so was this just a one-time event? You know, kind of a single thing that happened uh, to give us some important information. And, and Peter actually answers that question. He tells everyone there that what they are witnessing is not just for the people it happened to. It's for them also and their children and their grandchildren. And then he gives a phrase that can be interpreted two ways. He says, as many as who are far off, that can be interpreted generationally for as many generations that come and geographically, as far away as you possibly live. And what he wants people to know is that what God is investing in, in, the, in the world that day is for anyone. It's for everyone. What's also interesting is that on that day, uh, the, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come on, say, the 12 apostles. Like out of the 120, those were the people who had spent the most time with Jesus. They'd actually received the most teaching. Holy Spirit doesn't just come on them. It comes on everyone. That this isn't the segregation of the elite within the church from everyone else, but it's an invitation to anyone who wants to receive what the Holy Spirit offers. And this day is actually not an arbitrary day. It's, it's not a random event in the calendar, that there's something very strategic about it. So the day is called Pentecost. It was actually called that before this. It's part of the Jewish calendar. It's a, it's a festival. It's a feast day. And uh, so what does Pentecost mean? And the first thing is, is that Pentecost means 50. Literally, that's what the phrase means. It's, it's 50. And it is a holiday that already existed on the Jewish calendar. Um, it celebrated a feast called First Fruits. And uh, this occurred on the first uh, uh, day after the Sabbath following Passover. Every year there'd be Passover, and then there would be the Sabbath that followed Passover, and the very next day would be first fruits. And that's when they would celebrate what is new life coming out of the ground, basically. And what's really cool about this is that Jesus was crucified on Passover. And, and on the first Sabbath following Passover, on the day of first fruits, Jesus raises from the dead. Uh, first fruits is always on a Sunday. And 50 days later, seven weeks plus one day, is the Feast of Pentecost. And that's always also on a Sunday. Jesus rose from the dead and the church is birthed 50 days later. Now, Pentecost is also about harvest. Pentecost is about harvest. Uh, they lived in a very agrarian society, an, an agricultural uh, society where, where farming was essential to the ongoing survival of any community. And so this was the beginning of a significant season of harvest in their lives. And so God is communicating something to the church. And what he's saying is that the church is about harvest. That that's what I want you to think about. It was already ingrained into their thinking on that day. And Jesus is telling his church, this is what the church is about. In John 4, he said this. He said, open your eyes. The fields are already white for harvest. In Matthew, the ninth chapter, he says that the harvest is huge. It's the workers who are few. So our responsibility is to pray that there are people who will go out into the harvest and bring them in. So Pentecost is about harvest. Pentecost is also about community. 
Um, it's actually the most inclusive festival of all the festivals and holidays on the Jewish calendar. Deuteronomy 16 actually gives us information about who was to be included. And what it says is that it's for you, it's for your sons, it's for your daughters, it's for your men, it's for your women, it's for citizens of the country, it's for foreigners who are in the country. It includes the fatherless, it includes the widows. Basically, if you were there, you got to participate. Everyone was welcome. That's why Luke makes an effort at showing how many of the different people groups are represented. All those names that are a little bit hard to pronounce and places that we would have a hard time locating on a map. He was identifying that they are included because that's what Pentecost is about. And these weren't just Jews. Jews had been spread throughout the world uh, in a season when they had been taken over and taken captive and moved to all kinds of places in the world. And they would often come back for holidays. But there were also people who would come with them that were from those countries and from those ethnic groups. And they had become followers of the God of the Jews. And as a result, they would come and they would participate in Pentecost. And they came from places like Iran, modern-day Iran, and Iraq, and Turkey, and Africa, and Europe. And it's a really powerful picture. Uh, this is so amazing to me that what Jesus is saying to his church, it doesn't matter what language you speak. It doesn't matter what food you eat. It doesn't matter what your fashion style is, that you don't have to change those things to get in on the one thing that God knows is the most important thing. And that's being welcomed into his kingdom, into his church. Another really cool thing is everyone hears the word of God in their own language. And God is, is giving us a really important piece of information that when you hear or read God's word in English, it is God's word. And if you hear or read God's word in Russian or in Portuguese or Italian or Japanese or Spanish, whatever the language is, it is God's word. You might not know, but in some world religions, it's only the original language that's considered God's word. And so if you have a translation, they don't consider that God's word at all. That's just an explanation. And you're supposed to learn the original language. And, and Jesus is just telling everybody, you are welcome to the community. And Pentecost is about commitment. Uh, 50 days after the Passover, God gave the Ten Commandments. And these aren't just rules to live by. He's saying, I'm committed to developing you as a people and to bringing you into your destiny. And this is how I'm going to get you there. This is how you actually build a life that is fruitful and flourishes wherever you are. Well, Jesus is raised from the dead. And 50 days later, uh, Pentecost. And, and what, what God is saying is, I'm committed to you. Just like I gave the law 50 days after Passover, I'm giving the Spirit, 50 days after resurrection. I'm committed to your development. I'm committed to your destiny. And this isn't just something that you're going to observe. It's something you get to participate in. So a question I might ask you is, do you consider yourself a confident person? And I think some of us, if we're not extroverts, we don't think we're very confident. And then some of us, if we think we don't, we don't have as many competencies as other people, like some people can do more things, so we assume they are more confident. The question I have, though, for you today is how confident are you that God will use you to help bring people into his kingdom? And I'd like to suggest that our text reveals three reasons, three ways for you to be able to increase your confidence. And the first is this, God initiates and then he invites. First he initiates, then he invites. See, the disciples were waiting for 10 days, but it's God who took action. And the action he took is fairly impressive. It wasn't an actual wind that was blowing things apart, but the sound was the same as kind of that violent, deafening, storm-quality wind. And it was heard throughout the city. People came running because they heard that. And then there was this ball of fire that seemed to appear and, and, and it seems to be disintegrating or coming apart, spinning, and, and individual flames are going out, but they're not just hitting walls, they're actually hovering over the tops of individual people. And this had incredible symbolism to everyone who was in the room that day because of what they knew of Scripture. Fire always represented something of the presence of God. 
For example, when Abraham was making his covenant with God and there was uh, pieces of a sacrifice that were divided, that God actually appeared and, and in a fire that walked through the pieces and made his promise. Or when God called Moses to be the person who would be a deliverer for his people, he appeared to Moses in a burning bush, a fire in a bush. Or when God's people were being released from and set free from their land of bondage in Egypt, there was a pillar of fire that helped guide them not only across the Red Sea, but through the wilderness that they would have to go through. And this is what God is saying. I'm doing this for every one of you. There's a flame that lands and hovers on every single person in the room. What God is saying is, I am here to, to keep my promise. Make a promise and keep my promise to you. I am here here to use you to bring a work of freedom into others life I am here so that I can lead and guide you into all the ways that you should go every single one of them and the thing is if you and I were responsible to initiate all of that that would be way too much pressure for us God initiates and then he invites us to participate uh, second reason for confidence is that God makes personal investments God makes personal investments Everyone who was there spoke in a different language about the wonderful things of God. Now, there were people who were older and younger. They all spoke. There were people who were male and female. They all spoke. It's astonishing to me how often we assume that if we were in a space like that, we would not be included. That somehow others are more qualified. Here's what you need to know about the greatest qualification you can have for God. It's not your ability. It's your availability. Are you available to him? See, God has come to fully enfranchise you. You're not just a participant. You're not just a supporter of. You're a participant in what he is doing in the world today. And, and what God did is he put a miracle on their lips. Don't you want God to put a miracle on your lips today? To fully enfranchise you to be all that he's called you to be. Uh, third reason, God fulfills his word in you. Everyone was quite perplexed by what they were seeing. Galileans were not known for their education or multilingual capacity. Uh, in fact, uh, they, the view of them was not very high. And so when they saw all these Galileans that were speaking in, in, in perfect dialect, different languages, it perplexed the people who were watching that, and they were talking about the wonderful things of God. Now, Jesus had prepared them, but this was also prophesied in the book of Joel. And that's what Peter stands up and, and lets everyone know. I know this is confusing to you. I know this is perplexing to you, but this is actually God's word being fulfilled in you, through you, before you. This is a very important thing for us to know. We don't have to fear any gift that God wants to give us. God's active work in the world is actually included in Scripture. There are things that he is at work doing. We don't have to fear them. There's something that will build your confidence when you come to realize that what God is doing in you is actually foretold in his word. So the Holy Spirit came on this community of faith. Every individual was able to participate. But the Holy Spirit didn't actually fall on random houses or random people who were just walking down the street. The Holy Spirit came to that community of faith who were, who were waiting, who were praying. And um, this can make us a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, there were some people who were who were hearing this, and, and I've actually been asked this, do you suppose that maybe the miracle was on the hearing side of the equation that everyone just heard? Like they were just speaking in their own language, but everyone heard them in their own language. And so it's a miracle of hearing, and, and Peter answers that question. He tells us that every single one of those individuals spoke in different languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Now, some made fun of that. When you don't understand a language, sometimes the way a language sounds can be humorous to you. Also, when people are uncomfortable, they will revert to humor. 
in order to try to offset some of the discomfort and awkwardness that they're feeling. And so some people just said, maybe these guys are drunk. Maybe it sounded like slurred speech and gibberish to them. Two sheets to the wind, people who are just making a lot of noise. And what Peter says is, they're not drunk. What he says is, they're under the influence, but not of alcohol. They're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that people who are under the influence of alcohol tend to talk a little louder? They tend to seem to be a little bit happier, at least their emotions are a little more out there. And they seem to be more confident. They're willing to try things. This is why lots of people revert to alcohol in order to work up courage to do something. Wouldn't it be great? In fact, this is what the scripture tells us, is that we can have access to that kind of courage and that kind of joy and that kind of confidence without compromising our capacity in any way, but just simply being available to the Holy Spirit. So how do we respond? Repent. Now, a lot of people think that repentance is just the confession of previous sinful behavior you've been engaged in, but repentance is not limited to that. Repentance as changing the way you think about God and about yourself. In fact, this is what I would like to suggest to you. I believe that most of our sinful behavior flows out of a misconception that we have about God and about ourselves. And we have to see God differently. Some people think that God was just angry in the Old Testament and then he just turned into a nicer person in the New Testament. The cross did not change the heart of God. The cross revealed the heart of God. We were the ones who misunderstood. And once you see God through the cross, you see him the way he actually is. He also says, be baptized, repent, change the way you think, because that's going to change everything else. Be baptized. He's saying, follow through. Um, Baptism is not an initiating action. You're, you're not making yourself saved by, by being baptized. It's accepting an invitation. And uh, by the way, we're planning. We've, we've had some people request uh, uh, baptisms. And so we're planning to have a baptism available soon, upcoming. In fact, you can go online. And it's rcalvary.org forward slash baptism. And you should be able to find some information about how to sign up for that. See, uh, it's very easy to criticize what we don't like in the world. Our culture is full of that. In fact, if you are particularly harsh and unkind, you will get the most possible attention. It's also very easy to conform just because we fear the kinds of things that could happen to us or the things that are said about us, we will conform. And what baptism reminds us is that criticism and conformity will not change our world. We can die to that life and we can rise again in the life that the Holy Spirit calls us to in Jesus Christ. We can die to that way of life and then receive the Holy Spirit. What I can tell you is this, is that wherever Jesus is exalted, the Holy Spirit descends. That wherever we lift Jesus up, the Spirit comes down. And that's a good place to start. I would encourage you today Find a place, find a time, lift your voice, put the name of Jesus on your lips and see if he will put a miracle on your lips. I have a question. What if God gave you a syllable or a word or a phrase that you didn't understand? What would you do with that? If that came to your mind, what would you do? Would you dismiss it? Would you discount it? Or would you embrace it and say it out loud? and watch what God does with that. So I'd like you to pray with me today. Heavenly Father, um, we're not always as courageous as we desire to be. We often feel disqualified and excluded. And yet Pentecost reminds us that you, you are willing to make a significant investment into each and every one of our lives. Would you help us begin today by changing the way we think about you, your agenda, about ourselves. Help us to be able to follow through on that in a very real way. And then as we put the name 
of Jesus on our lips, would you put a miracle on our lips? In Jesus' name, amen.